Okay, so mitral stenosis was the, one of the very first diseases that was ever diagnosed, and it was diagnosed using echocardiography in 1968. It was also the very first lesion to be successfully treated with surgery in 1923. It was the first valve lesion that was successfully treated with percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty in 1984. It's the second most common valvular lesion in developing countries. The, the first most common is a combination of mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. So basically what you see in these pathology slides is you have significant thickening of the uh, leaflet, it, the arrows pointing to all that calcification in the anterior leaflet, and of the commissure, so the valve becomes restricted and doesn't open completely. In panel B and C, you see that there's incredible thickening and shortening and calcification of the chordae, which also occurs during this disease process. When you compare it to the valvular tissue in the chordae in panel D in a normal heart, you can see how you know, the normal valve tissue is almost like cellophane, and you can see how thickened and, and calcified these chordae and, and the valve actually become. So this is what it looks like using echocardiography. You can see that because the commissures are fused, the, it, the, the, basically the valve cannot open completely, and that anterior leaflet in that upper left-hand panel opens like a hockey stick, and we call that a hockey stick a deformation of the anterior mitral leaflet. When you look at the upper left-hand corner, that's the short axis, and again, you can see that the commissures are fused on either edge, so it opens kind of like a fish mouth. In the lower left and the lower right-hand panel, again, you see that the valve opening is restricted during diastole, and that basically leads to you know, incomplete emptying of that left atrium during diastole. The left atrium increases significantly, and the most common complication with mitral stenosis, therefore, is atrial fibrillation. The most common form of mitral stenosis here in the United States is actually calcific mitral stenosis. And this is what it looks like on echocardiography. It's calcification of that annulus, and it always starts on that posterior lateral annulus. It goes up and captures that posterior valve, or mitral valve leaflet, so that becomes restricted and doesn't move very much. Um, but because it's involving the annulus and not the leaflets themselves, you can see that the anterior leaflet on both the upper and left upper left and right hand panel opens nicely so that rarely does that valve become very stenotic. And you can see in the lower left hand panel, the left atrium really isn't that large. When we do Doppler, frequently we won't find more than mild mitral stenosis in this type of mitral valve disease. So how do we tell how severe mitral stenosis is? Well, we have two different uh, two different ways. One is to use Doppler, which allows us to measure mean gradients across the valve. Another way is to actually measure that mitral valve area, and we're going to go through those real quickly. So to measure the mean gradient, we use this modified Bernoulli equation, which is just measuring all these four V squareds underneath that stenotic jet. You don't have to calculate it yourself. We just trace that CW jet in the echo lab, and it spits it out, and it tells us exactly what that mean gradient is. And we know if it's less than 5, it's mild mitral stenosis. 5 to 10 is moderate, and greater than 10 is severe. Now, there are problems, though, if you just use a mean gradient to, to determine how severe the mitral stenosis is in your patient. It's not going to be accurate 100% of the time. And that's because high flow rates are going to lead to really high transmitral pressure gradients with only a mild or moderate degree of valve stenosis. And when does that happen? That it happens in tachycardias, such as atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or sinus tachycardia, where diastole is really shortened, and therefore your mean gradients could be really high. And we're going to look at that in a minute. It occurs with mitral regurgitation when you have so much flow across that stenotic valve. It also occurs in anemia where you have high outputs and also very high flow across that valve. The opposite is also true. If you have very low flow rates, you can have very low transmitral gradients, and therefore you could have severe mitral stenosis and just the low mean gradient. And when does that happen? Well, that happens in people with cardiomyopathies who have you know, EFs that are severely depressed, and in people with profound bradycardia. Now, atrial fibrillation is just a problem because there's a lot of B2B data variability, and it's because of that changing diastolic filling period, it's going to affect your mean gradient significantly. And if it's a very technically difficult study, again, you could underestimate that degree of that mean gradient because of an increased angle between how you're measuring it and the true stenotic jet. So this is an example of a patient who came to the lab. And you can see we traced that 
stenotic CW jet across that mitral valve. We got a mean greater than less than five, which is consistent with mild mitral stenosis. We then used a pressure halftime formula to calculate the valve area. We got 1.2, which is moderate mitral stenosis. Basically, this happens all the time. This is, not a, this is not uncommon. So you have to look at each and try and figure out, well, which is it? Is it mild or is it moderate? In this particular case, if you look in the very top left-hand panel, you can see the heart rate's 49. So that's prolonging the diastolic filling period. So the mean gradient is, is allowed to be really, really low in this case. So in this particular patient, they really do have moderate mitral stenosis. This is just showing you how that heart rate affects the mean gradient. So if you have a very fast heart rate, you have a very short diastolic filling period, you're gonna look like the one in the middle. So if you take all those four V squares, they're very, very tall, so the mean is gonna be very, very high. If you have a very slow heart rate, it's gonna look like the one on the end. So if you take all those four V squares, you could have some, half are gonna be very tall, half very short, so the mean's gonna be much, much lower. You can plenimeter the valve to determine the severity of mitral stenosis, and this is just showing us, tracing it, and telling you the mitral valve area is 1.2. Of course, it also has problems. If the image quality is poor, you can't trace it. If the valve anatomy is very deformed, you can't trace it accurately. If the gain settings are too high, there's so much blooming artifact from the calcification of the valve, you're gonna overestimate the severe mitral stenosis. If you're not in the right plane, if you're at the annulus rather than at the tips, you're gonna underestimate the severity of mitral stenosis. So what else can we do? Well, we can go to back to Doppler again, and we can calculate the mitral valve area using the pressure half time, which is, is the time that it takes for that gradient across the mitral valve to decay in half. And we know that that mitral valve area is equal to 220 divided by that pressure half time. And basically, this slide, we're gonna skip it, but it's just showing you that it correlates really nicely when compared to an invasive measurement in the cath lab. So there are limitations of the pressure half time for mitral stenosis, just like there were for the mean gradient, and those include atrial fibrillation because of that beat to beat variability. If you have aortic regurgitation, what's that gonna do? It's gonna increase your LV and diastolic pressure. If you increase that pressure, you're gonna decrease the time that that pressure gradient decays in half. Um, if you have a change in LV and LA compliance, which occurs during a vital valvuloplasty, it's going to affect your pressure half time. And if the slope is not constant, it's not going to correlate well with the mitral valve area. So we're going to skip this again, but again, it's just showing you that atrial fibrillation causes significant uh, problems when calculating the mitral valve area using pressure half time because it's just not ac as accurate as if the patients were in normal situs rhythm. Um, and we're gonna skip this one too, but again, it's showing you with aortic regurgitation, it, it increases that left ventricular and diastolic pressure, and therefore, when you compare with patients with and without, it doesn't correlate as nicely with that mitral valve area determined in the cath lab. So how about those mitral velocity profiles? How does that affect your pressure half time? Well, we talked about how you have to have a constant decay, which means more than 50% of the time that slope in that, like in that very first hand panel has to be constant. If it's constantly changing, the valve area is not going to correlate with that pressure decay, and therefore you cannot use the pressure half time in that particular case to, to determine what the mitral valve area really is. So this is an example of a patient that came to the lab. In the upper left-hand panel, you can see the mitral valve is very thickened, the posterior leaflet's fixed. You know, it looks like a significant degree of mitral valve stenosis. You can see the aortic valve is replaced, so this patient has a prosthetic aortic valve. You go to the left upper hand panel and you can see we used that pressure half time, we just plugged it into the formula, and we got a valve area 2.8 centimeters squared, which is consistent with insignificant mitral stenosis. However, when we went and used the continuity equation, which we'll discuss about in a little bit, to calculate the mitral valve area, that's down on the bottom, we got 1.45 centimeters squared, which is consistent with moderate. And the question again, like the other case, is which is, which is correct? So in this particular case, if you look at that upper right-hand panel, what you see is there's no constant slope. It's continuously changing. Therefore, when you see it continuously changing and not a constant decay, you can't use the pressure half time to calculate the mitral stenosis. So how, what is the continuity equation? Well, the continuity equation with any sort of valve lesion allows you to calculate that area of that valve by just knowing the stroke volume and dividing it by the velocity of that, the time velocity integral of that stenotic jet. It'll give you the valve area every single time. Mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, they're this, exactly the same thing. 
Now, there are limitations of the continuity equation, though, also, and these limitations are atrial fibrillation, again, because of that beat-to-beat -beat variability, and just makes it look, you know, each, each time velocity integral is going to be different, depending on that RR interval. Aortic regurgitation is a limitation only if you calculate that stroke volume through the left ventricular outflow track. And why is that? Because there's regurgitation volume in there due to the AI, and it's going to cause you to overestimate your stroke volume, and therefore that's going to lead you to underestimate your severity of mitral stenosis if you use it. Mitral regurgitation is also going to have a problem. Why? There's increased volume going back and forth across that mitral valve. You're going to increase that time velocity integral that goes on the bottom of that equation and is going to cause you to overestimate the severity of mitral stenosis. So this is just looking at what AFib does. Just imagine this is a patient with varying RR intervals, so very irregular heart rates, and you can see that you, your time velocity integral could be anywhere from 45 to 55. So what do we do in those cases? Well, basically, the best that we can, and that means averaging about five beats to try and get as close as we can to what the true mitral valve area is. Um, we're going to skip this real quick in the interest of time, but you have all of these slides, and I think they're pretty explanatory, self-explanatory. So this is another example of a patient who came to the lab, and you can see in the upper left-hand panel again, there's hockey stick def deformation, posterior leaflet fixed, looks like there's mitral stenosis. In the upper right-hand panel, we calculated in the mitral valve area using pressure half time, we got 1.2 centimeters squared. On the bottom-hand panel, we calculated using the continuity equation, we got 0.8 eight, nine centimeters squared. So again, a huge discrepancy. So we have to look back and try and figure out, well, what, what's, what, which one's more, most correct? In this particular case, if you look, I didn't show you the color, but if you look on the bottom left-hand panel, there's a lot of flow during systole in the opposite direction, that's mitral regurgitation. So this patient had significant mitral regurgitation, which is increasing that mitral valve TVI and therefore causing you to overestimate your severity of mitral stenosis. So basically, sometimes we have discrepancies between what we say the, mitral, the degree of mitral stenosis is and what the patient's symptoms are. And what do we do in that particular case? Well, it usually happens when patients are particularly small or very, very large. So in that particular case, in a very, very large patient, for example, maybe that mild or moderate mitral stenosis is severe for that patient. So in that particular patient, we will send that patient for a bicycle stress echo, see what that mean gradient does when they exercise and what their PA pressures does and how their RV responds. And if that mean gradient triples and that PA pressure is way more than 50, it suggests that that is significant mitral stenosis for that particular patient. So what is the role of TEE in mitral stenosis? Well, the, the TEE, there's only two roles. The first is if it's a patient who's having a lot of symptoms, the mitral stenosis isn't that significant, and you're worried that you can't see the mitral regurgitation because of all the shadowing from the calcification on the valve. So you're doing it to try and determine how bad that mitral regurgitation is. The second is it's a patient, the, t the transthoracic, they're a good candidate for a valvular plasty. So you have to determine the severity of mitral regurgitation. It has to be mild or less. And you have to rule out a thrombus in the left atrial appendage. Now, catheterization, there is absolutely no role anymore in mitral stenosis unless the patient has a very technically difficult echo. There's something called the Wilkins score or the splitability index, and this is basically a score that the interventional cardiologist will use in trying to determine whether or not a patient is appropriate for valvuloplasty. So you can see the four different categories. You get a point for each one of these categories. You total the whole score. If it's less than eight, they're suitable. If it's eight to 10, they may be suitable. If it's more than 10, they're unsuitable. So what would that look like? Ooh, that first slide is interesting. So basically, I'm not for sure what happened to that first one. But the second one, you can see that there's some thickening and calcification of that valve. There's still pretty good mobility. The cordae are involved. That would probably fall within the 8 to 10. The first one was supposed to be even better, which was going to show you less than 8. But there's something wrong. That's, that picture is not quite the right picture. So that one would be suitable for valvuloplasty. The bottom two, you can see that the valve becomes less mobile, becomes more thickened, but becomes more calcified. The bottom two wouldn't be candidates for mitral valvuloplasty because, you know, basically they, the Wilkins score is it's too high in these particular patients. So how do patients do with mitral stenosis? 
These are just reports from different countries all over the world. So they're single center trials. And basically, the ones on the bottom are medical therapy. They do poorly by 10 years. The ones on the top are either percutaneous valvuloplasty or surgery. How about how do patients do if you compare surgery versus percutaneous valvuloplasty? Well, it all depends. The green are the people who, have, who are older, advanced age, meaning is about 60 in those guys, and they have higher degrees of heart failure. If you're younger, and you have less degrees of heart failure, you do much better. And those are all the guys on the top, which you can see have done quite well in over the 10, 15 year time span of their follow-up. And that's it. Thank you.